Okay, welcome back everyone. Our speaker today is Ines Birgin from Microsoft, uh, where he was working at, at the Autonomous Systems Division, focusing on Project Bonsai. Uh, he received his master's and PhD in systems engineering from Boston University. And he is a machine learning research practitioner and a researcher. And uh, most interestingly, he has recently written a book called Mastering Reinforcement Learning with Python. So we are very much looking forward to this. And um, so I hope uh, it works for you, Ines. Yes, um, let me share my screen. Um, thank you very much, by the way, for having me here. It's, it's a um, real pleasure. So um, hoping to share some of the learnings that I have had uh, or, or recent past and also would love to hear your comments. So um, uh, I think it's okay if we get started, right? Yeah, please start. Okay. So uh, yeah, so, so today I'd like to uh, discuss some of the uh, challenges that I face and we face in our group when we try to bring reinforcement learning um, to real world. And what are some of the approaches that we are leveraging? Um, certainly, this is not going to be a list of all of the challenges and all the approaches that we can uh, come up with. But hopefully, I'm going. I'm hoping to give you some perspective. Uh, hopefully, some different perspective um, about how real, real, real world reinforcement learning can be uh, can be thought. So. Uh, to do that, so let me start with where we are at with reinforcement learning. And I, at this point, I will be speaking to the choir a little bit, uh, but let me start with the uh, recent success stories of reinforcement learning. So we have seen phenomenal, phenomenal stories uh, as, as deep reinforcement learning is taking off. So starting with Atari games, Alf, with AlphaGo, we are able to beat uh, world champions in, in a very difficult uh, board game. Dota 2 and StarCraft 2, they are uh, solving uh, very long-term strategy games uh, and, and competing with world champions. OpenAI uh, trained a robot head in simulation and successfully transferred that uh, agent to real world in a, in a challenging dexterous hand problem. And uh, Mu Zero and Google DeepMind, they're able to um, teach agents uh, how to play games without even knowing the rules of the game as well. And th these are super, super exciting, um, exciting stories. And uh, if you uh, look at the grand promise of reinforcement learning and what it, what it means, it is near optimal sequential decision-making under uncertainty to maximize some long-term benefit. And when you use this definition, everything in life seems to me like a reinforcement learning problem from, from how to move your arm to grab a, a glass of water to how to do, a, do your career planning basically. So life is full of uncertainty. If you didn't believe it last year, I hope you believe it this year. Um, we hopefully care about some long-term um, benefits and all these all these involve sequential decision making where our current decisions uh, lead to long term consequences. And there's a lot of research certainly going on in, in, in the field as well. So if you look at uh, this, uh, this chart shared by uh, Professor Cardone about iClear 2021 um, keywords, reinforcement learning is right below deep learning keyword used in the papers. And um, Dr. Katya Hoffman shared something similar. Uh, for for the NURBS, in the, at the NURBS conference in in um, in 2019 December, yet real life success stories in reinforcement learning are still rarity. So it's it's not like they're they're non-existent, but they're not as common and certainly not at the, at the level we would hope. So there are definitely some success stories for example a famous example is next netflix artwork personalization so netflix displays you basically a specific artwork for a movie among a set of artworks that you you will find hopefully interesting and recently we we published a story um together with pepsico and this this was published in wall street journal and in our blog that we are using reinforcement learning in Cheetos manufacturing. And Google AI and Loon, they recently 
trained a reinforcement learning agent to control their uh, uh, the internet balloons in the stratosphere uh, for their navigation. So it's not like they're non-existent, but if you look at these examples, well, personalization is a great, great application area for reinforcement learning, but it is mostly banded problems, which are one-step reinforcement learning. And you, if you look at our example uh, of, of manufacturing, well, the story got published in the Wall Street Journal, meaning that it's not an everyday thing. And Google AI and Loon collaboration, uh, well, these guys have one of the brightest minds on earth to do something like this. So the question is, okay, how do we bring reinforcement learning to mainstream? And how do we see more everyday uh, applications of reinforcement learning, and there are cer certainly major challenges in front of this. But hopefully, this will likely change soon. So let me let me go over some of the key challenges and um, some of the solution approaches that you might find interesting. So uh, in the talk, in, in the talk, I will focus some of the challenges and some of the approaches. And as a disclaimer, a lot of the talking points are from my experience at Microsoft's Project Bonsai, which is a reinforcement learning uh, which is a platform to train autonomous agents and we are heavily leveraging reinforcement learning. Uh, but I am here at, at my own capacity and these are most of my personal and professional views. If you're interested in the Microsoft, uh, more official um, definitions and stories, I would suggest you to um, visit the website of autonomous systems. So the, let's get started. So the, the most important challenge is perhaps the sample efficiency, right? So um, if you look at these examples, this is Atari 57 paper. This is comparisons of uh, various algorithms on Atari benchmarks. Look at this axis. It says, this is a, around 50 billion frames to train an agent on an Atari game. So yes, this agent is doing much better than humans do, but 50 billion frames, this is, this is insane. And if you look at the uh, OpenAI's Dota 2 uh, work, they were collecting 900 years of worth of experience per day, and they were training their model um, on 128,000 CPUs and 250, 56 GPUs. So this is, this is certainly not, not all, organizations can do. And so th the hunger for data in reinforcement learning is much worse than that of deep supervised learning, obviously. So if you if you look into why this could be the case, I think it, it would be nice to go over the classic RL loop. And we have an agent that takes actions based on observations and there's uncertain environment. We do sequential decision-making. We, we, we are trying to maximize long-term benefit. We generate, the action generates experience with random actions and, uh, and it learns from experience. And this is what makes reinforcement learning exciting. And this is how, why we are finding it similar to human animal learning. And it, it, it is a great benefit. It's a great, it's a very powerful framework to be able to learn from experience. And, and from exploration. Well, it, it is similar to human learning, except not that much. So if you look into, if you think about it, how we actually learn, uh, we, yes, like reinforcement learning agents, we explore different decisions in various cir circumstances, that's for sure. We exploit most of the time, like reinforcement learning agents do. Yes, that's, that's not the whole story of how humans learn, right? So we are not deserted on earth, uh, des deserted on earth as lonely agents wandering around to discover stuff. And actually that, that, would, that would have severe consequences. I think if you were to do random, take random actions at, at odd situations to see, just to see what happens, you would be fired from your work and your wife would divorce you. Imagine that in, in a parent-teacher meeting, you're just starting to jump around on the desk just to explore, to see what happens. That's not a good idea. And that, that's not quite what we do. So instead, we have a whole education system designed to teach us stuff. And it is not just the education system, it's 
a lot of a lot of other means of learning, right? So we, we spent most of our time learning from experts um, through formal and informal channels. So school is a, maybe a formal channel, but then we have things like books, webinars, Twitter, Facebook, what 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 have you, where we collect information, and we that that's and this this learning continues throughout the life. So, and the entire education system is designed around this idea of conveying expertise from um, people who generated before you um, to you effectively, starting with fundamentals up to advanced levels. So, and this is efficient, right? It, it would suck to be having to constantly reinvent the wheel on every single topic. So, the idea is why not educate machines similarly? And that's one of the focuses that, that we have in our group. So we call this machine teaching. It's, uh, it, it's, it's also referred, to, this term is also referred to in other places as well. Um, so we are heavy advocates of machine teaching. What is machine teaching? Well, it's a paradigm that suggests transferring knowledge, um, subject matter expertise, from that are, that are available in humans to machine learning models to facilitate training and learning. So just like schools have uh, an education system have uh, a, a specific set of uh, tools built around this, this, this theme of teaching, um, machine teaching also involves uh, creating and building such tools to convey this knowledge from experts to um, from experts to machines. And these 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 experts, well, as I will come to later, they don't have to be hopefully machine learning scientists as far as you have the right tools to make the transfer knowledge uh, transfer of the knowledge. So right now I'm going to focus on a couple of themes in in machine teaching and probably you have been using um, most of these these approaches, uh, but maybe you didn't have this perspective of teaching. And I would like to maybe frame this, what, what you might have been already doing a little bit differently and in this paradigm of machine teaching. So one example of how machine, uh, one of the approaches inside machine teaching is to, for example, divide the tasks into uh, a task into sub subconcepts or subtasks or concepts. Well, what I mean by that is rather than training a basketball playing agent over an entire game, you basically design some concepts within the game that you, you think is necessary to master to win the game and you train the agent uh, on these concepts. For example, you, you define a dribbling concept, you define a passing, shooting concepts, etc. And you, you then train or uh, use a selector concept to switch uh, between these, these concepts during the game. So this, it turns out that this is a pretty powerful tool and actually can solve problems that are uh, not quite possible to solve otherwise, or that would take very long time to solve other, otherwise by um, dividing and essentially concurring the, concurring the task. Um, this, this facilitates learning because, uh, well, smaller tasks are usually easier to learn than entire end-to-end -end, um, missions. The created assignment gets easier. You know where the agent is, is failing and uh, where it is succeeding. And you can basically spend your training budget by focusing on, on the skills that the agent is, is weak. Um, so it is, in this case, it is machine teachers duty to design the concepts. So we assume that you know well about basketball to be able to identify, okay, these are the skills, these are the concepts to master and define a reward function for each concept and train again, code rules to switch between concepts. And these are not easy undertakings, but the thing is that it could again make learning when designed correctly, it could make the learning much more simple, efficient and feasible in cases that could have been infeasible otherwise. Second idea is to use a 
curriculum, right? So when you start school, if you have kids going to maybe kindergarten, first grade, what have you, well, hopefully they don't start with derivatives and integrals, right? Right. So we, in our own education system, we start with very, very basic stuff. Well, why not do the same uh, with machine uh, with machines as well? And this, this curriculum learning is there, and it is it is being used, and it is it turns out that it is pretty effective, and um, it 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 really uh, improves the sample efficiency. So this using a curriculum involves parameterizing the concept difficulty. So in the example of basketball, maybe the per parameter would be the number of players to dribble through. And what you could do then is gradually increase the difficulty. So maybe start with zero players, just move the ball and then uh, introduce one player, two players and whatnot. So with that, you basically transition to a next lesson. If the agent is successful in the current lesson, uh, if the agent is, is failing in the current lesson, maybe you fall back to a previous lesson. And again, it, you can find papers that show curriculum learning is, is actually making agents uh, achieve much more difficult tasks than they could without a curriculum when they face the most difficult um, sort of uh, task right away. And again, it is machine teachers duty to define the parameterization and what the lessons are, define the success and failure criteria, but there are also automated approaches, right? So the open AIs work on the solving Rubik's cube. They're using something called automatic domain randomization where the parameters are different friction levels, uh, different uh, currents going into the actuators, et, et cetera. So it is not necessarily making also the making problem, making the problem more difficult or easy. It is also a uh, training agent for diff, a different set of uh, uh, environments. A, uh, another work that I find very interesting and these slides are available on GitHub. I can um, show you the link that was on the first slide again. Um, a, a work by Microsoft Research on absolute learning progress uh, combined with Gaussian mixture, mixture models. So what this approach does basically, let's say you have uh, 10 levels, 10 lessons uh, from the most easy to most difficult. And let's say your agent is doing pretty well until uh, lesson four, and then starting from that point on the, the performance decreases. Uh, this ALP, GMM, Absolute Learning Progress Gaussian Mixture, Mo Mixture Models uh, work, they focus on these areas that are not too easy, they're not too difficult, but th there's a drastic change in performance for the agent. So this, this is potentially a reasonable, th these areas in the configuration space are usually um, reasonably challenging tasks or reasonably challenging areas for the agent to be able to improve uh, improve itself. So, uh, and it, it makes a lot of sense, right? So uh, in, in life as well, you wanna take on challenges that are not gonna kill you, that they're gonna hopefully uh, improve you by, uh, by, by making you some headaches, but not, not too much, hopefully. So that's that's basically the same idea, and you can you can find on the paper and on the GitHub page that um, how the OpenAI's bipedal walker um, is is able to run in a course with obstacles, uh, with, with, with like severe obstacles using this approach, which which uh, fails without a curriculum learning or without this absolute learning progress approach. So this is this is a very powerful tool to to use in machine teaching. Um, three, constrain the expo exploration. And that's that's what we do in real life as well, right? So what you can do is you can limit the available actions with respect to the observation and the environment. And definitely I am doing this with my kids when they're trying to climb the stairs from weird locations. I say, okay, no, 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 don't do that. I, I see what you're doing, that, that's not a good direction. Why not? Why not do the same uh, with 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 machines, right? So, and I, in my experience, action masking, um, parameterizing the action space and limiting the 
available actions based on uh, the observation that can drastically uh, in, improve the sample efficiency. Uh, and it's, it's in, in, for example, in the basketball example, you can say things like, okay, don't run forward after losing the ball. Or you can, you can similarly uh, constrain the states to be, this, uh, to be explored uh, if, if you know that they're absolutely bad. And you can, for example, use uh, terminal conditions for that and say things like, well, don't bunch together in the offense. And these are not easy things to define, and these this this is not always obvious. But sometimes they're really obvious to a subject matter expert working on a specific industry problem for for a long time. Um, providing feedback, yes, we are providing feedback, uh, obviously to to the agent through reward functions, and uh, we we can more effectively use that. So you can engineer the reward function uh, to incentivize good behavior. And I have two phrases here. Well, engineer it at your own risk uh, because your intention may not be actually what the agent follows. It is pretty hard to turn um, qualitative objectives into uh, fun mathematical functions. So it is hard to define what is good and bad mathematically. But sometimes this is more obvious and this is something Definitely to keep in mind, and this is this is this is pretty common, right? So you probably have been doing this if you have been working on reinforcement learning, and you know that it, is, it could be really painful and whatnot. But it it is it it's it could be pretty effective too. So for example, in a basketball game, also rewards successfully completed passes, not just the scored uh, scored shoots. Um, another example, and you can find research around this as well. You can train auxiliary models to classify behavior as, as good or bad. And um, I am planning to add a link here that I forgot to add, but basically there's, there's research around, let's say you're trying to uh, come up with a good dribbling behavior, right? So it is not, we said it's not always easy to define what is good dribbling, but you can perhaps classify a machine learning algorithm to say, when you compare two dribbling behavior, okay, this is good, this is not good. And hopefully this, this auxiliary model is going to pick up what is good dribbling and then guide the learning process accordingly for, for the reinforcement learning agent. So in short, machine teaching is, is it involves creating the tools to allow non-machine learning experts to convey their, convey their experience intuitively to reinforcement learning agents. So, and this is, I like this example that school teacher, teachers are not neuroscientists, but they are educating students. Engineers in industry, they don't have to be machine learning scientists to train machine learning models. Well, this requires us to create the bridge in between and uh, coming up with tools that are going to allow them effectively transfer their knowledge. And that's what we are trying to do but this, if you think about it, this this can unlock a lot of potential. For example, if you have an example, if 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 you have a tool to um, effectively parse natural language process, natural language to understand feedback, or you can if you can build maybe some interactive mechanisms <clears throat> for the teacher to provide feedback to the agent, under the hood you can shape the reward function automatically. And this is definitely not, a, not an easy undertaking, but in theory, yes, you can use that feedback to uh, shape your reward function so that your, your machine teacher, your subject matter expert, your chemical engineer, your uh, manufacturing yield optimization person, uh, he or she doesn't have to deal with the like painful reward function crafting, crafting process. And in turn, uh, this approach has potential to unlock a lot of potential in reinforcement learning. You can you can connect this very powerful framework with the whole world of engineers and subject matter experts available out there working that have been working on their problems for years. You know a lot of a lot of our, about their problems, and then uh, they can they can convey that knowledge to the machine. And there are fair criticisms to this approach as well. I'd like to mention those two and maybe um, uh, have a couple points in response. 
Well, isn't this future engineering on steroids? Um, yes, uh, a little bit, um, especially in the absence of the tools that makes this easy. Um, it, 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 it is a lot of work to design, um, let, let's say, curriculum, design reward function, and whatnot. But there's these tools are, are emerging as well. So I mentioned the automatic domain randomization. I, I mentioned the absolute learning progress ALP algorithm. These are pretty effective tools and that kind of takes away the burden of designing manual curriculum to a great extent. So these tools are, are emerging. And, um, and secondly, the subject matter experts know so much about their business problem. Why not leverage that knowledge to, for, for more effective engineering uh, teaching. And in the, fa in, in the end, uh, you will have hopefully more sample efficient training and um, you will be able to fa iter iterate fast on your ideas and solve new problems. Um, so another criticism, cri fair criticism is that, okay, aren't we inserting a bias to the learning? I mean, isn't the beauty of reinforcement learning that it can come up with some novel strategies that we have never thought of. Yes, we are inserting bias and that's why the learning is more efficient, but you don't need to discover genius strategies for everyday, let's say robot arm tasks in industry. And we, we are not, we are not, not all problems are like solving Go. There, there are pretty mundane tasks to automate in industry and business and you have pretty good idea about how to solve them and you really don't expect any any genius genius uh, strategy so it, it there are perfectly legitimate cases for inserting bias to the learning process are isn't this at odds approaches like mu zero a little bit but they're also complementary as i said we are uh, the real value in, or at least in the near term in reinforcement learning is to be able to automate and hopefully improve everyday business and industry tasks. And this does not require solving artificial general intelligence. Mu zero work and similar work is very valuable uh, towards our path to artificial general intelligence, but we have hopefully some easier tasks um, to solve. So, uh, with that, let me go into uh, the next challenge and I, the next two challenges are going to be hopefully shorter uh, in, the, in this presentation. A major challenge that we are seeing that you are probably aware, but maybe didn't think as much about is the need for simulation. Only a tiny fraction of all industry processes and business processes that can be automated with reinforcement learning have associated simulation models. And, you, and that's not very surprising because it's um, uh, building simulation models is, is pretty advanced stuff and it is, it is costly. Uh, why invest in that if you have a reasonable performance without a simulation for your process, right? So it's, it's it's not it's it's not in the radar or in the interest for every every business, and when a reinforcement learning model is a when a simulation model is available, it is not always suitable for reinforcement learning. That's what we are seeing. So it is either low fidelity, and it your your reinforcement learning overfits to to that low fidelity simulation model, and then uh, fails in real world. Um, they they are often when they are high fidelity they tend to be very slow so it takes very long time to let's say simulate a chemical process in some cases to collect one single experience tuple. A lot of the these simulation software are very domain specific and it could be really painful to integrate them with reinforcement learning libraries. Um, a lot of these, again, are constrained by licensing. So you cannot just uh, spin up 100,000 uh, instances of a simulation to collect experience that would bankrupt you. So that licensing is not designed around this. And there's, there's no capabilities in all cases of revealing observations to a third, like to an outside tool, resetting the, optim the, uh, 
uh, the simulation to, to some initial state, defining configurations for uh, domain randomization and whatnot. So the, 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 in practice, it turns out that these are very, these, these are posing a very high bar for entry to reinforcement learning uh, for, for, for companies. So, okay, what are some approaches? I think two uh, very promising approaches are uh, first offline reinforcement learning and then second better SIM RL integration tools that are being built. Offline reinforcement learning, I'm not going to go into details of that and you're probably aware. Uh, well, we don't have simulation, but we have a lot of data and process logs generated by, uh, by, by machines, by, by computers and whatnot, right? So offline reinforcement learning directly learns from data, offline data um, generated by perhaps a non-reinforcement learning controller. So if you have a, a manufacturing environment, if you're already using some PID controllers, if you're collecting logs, then you're in a good position to use offline reinforcement learning to improve that process. And the policy obviously does not interact directly with the environment during training. So your exploration is limited. Um, and it relies things like important sam sampling to evaluate a new policy. Uh, but, but this is very powerful. Again, just because we have a lot of data and we have a lot of processes and controllers already in place in manufacturing and supply chain, in robotics, et cetera. So if you can improve their efficiency by five, 10, 20% using um, offline reinforcement learning, that's, that's huge. Um, and more details you can find on this blog post by Professor Sergey Levine of uh, UC Berkeley. Um, that beautiful read, definitely take a look. It, uh, he goes into details of how, in the potential of offline reinforcement learning and how it is going to, how it is supposed to transform our machine learning thinking. Second is better uh, sim integrations. So offline reinforcement learning will always have limited capability due to lack of exploration and interaction with, with the environment. And what we are saying and what we are doing is that uh, what we are encouraging companies to do that is, is to create uh, their simulation models and digital twins for their processes. And more companies are paying attention to this. And, we, and in the meantime, you're also building this uh, bridges and integrations between um, simulation tools and simulation and reinforcement learning tools. For example, if you go to our Project Bonsai platform, you will see that, okay, I can uh, seamlessly connect my MathWorks uh, simulating model to, to Bonsai or my Analogic to Bonsai and we are bringing on more simulation vendors. A, a integration, integration, which could be a very painful thing is becoming very easy. And this is, this, this is not just us, there are other companies and organizations as well and tools as well building similar, uh, similar integrations. For example, if you look at tools like Flow, which connects reinforcement learning libraries such as RLLIP and um, others with micro traffic simulators with, to simulate uh, city traffic. Uh, you can, th that's a very useful integration because on one side you have this traffic simulation tool that has, that is being developed for, for two decades maybe. And now you have this RL technology and if you can hook them up together easily that, that brings a lot of potential and that really lowers the bar for entry um, uh, for people who are maybe uh, city, city engineers, uh, but not necessarily um, good software engineers. So um, third approach is uh, to, th third challenge is to, um, is, is the gap between simulation and real. So if you train your model in simulation, as I mentioned, it is not very easy to transfer that into, um, into real life. So because your, your agent tends to overfit the quirks of your simulation and fail in the real, real world. 
And we have tools to overcome this. For example, we have domain randomization and data augmentation, um, just like in, op in OpenAI's uh, solving Rubik's Cube uh, work. Uh, there are the downsides to this though. So it increases the training budget. So you, you need to spend more time on training. And for the sake of robustness, actually to, to make the agent robust to all possible scenarios, uh, it, it takes a toll on the performance on some of the common scenarios. So you, your, the agent's performance for some likely scenarios may deteriorate because you're trying to train it for, for a wide variety of of, of configurations. The other tool is meta reinforcement learning, where um, you basically um, come up with ways, uh, come up with procedures for the agent to, to adapt the environment after deployment. So what uh, building with building these procedures, you are embedding uh, good priors to your agent, and then uh, it hopefully uh, takes few more samples and in, in in after deployment and quickly adapts to the environment. Uh, this is a very promising research direction, but it is it is not as powerful as some of the other approaches yet. So there are some limitations. So okay, what can we do about this this thing, which is which is a major challenge? Well, actually, you can design the real world. So the generalization challenge for a self-driving car and the generalization challenge for a self-driving -drive forklift, they're not the same. In, in a self-driving car, you expect your car or you, you hope your car to drive in, in a, under very weird circumstances and in busy traffics and whatnot. But if you're training an agent uh, to drive forklift, this is going to be in a constrained environment and it is you have usually more control over such environments so it is people kind of hate when we say things like okay self-driving cars are only possible if you also change road infrastructure well that, that's not a cool idea to really change road infrastructure to uh, to enable self-driving cars because that, that's kind of weak ai but from practical perspective, if you're training an RL agent for an industry application, you also have, again, some control over the environment. So why not leverage that? So an example of this is to create unadversarial objects um, that are easy to, to be perceived, to be recognized by, by the agent. And this is a recent work by our um, uh, Microsoft Research Group. And uh, again, you can find um, the details of the work um, in, the, in this paper and the blog post by Hadi Salman and the team. The idea is that, okay, you have an object, you come up with a special texture uh, for the object that is going to make the uh, perception easy uh, for, uh, for reinforcement learning agent. So if this plane is trained, um, uh, it, it, it can be perceived well, in clean, clean weather conditions, but it can not be perceived, it cannot be recognized easily when there's fog and dust. Maybe again, add some texture, special texture to this, uh, to the body of the jet so that it is easy to recognize in different circumstances. This way, hopefully you don't have to create a, an insane amount of environment configurations. This texture is going to make the task much easier for you. So th this, this is a pretty powerful approach. Again, in a lot of situations we can leverage. And how this works is that it is basically reversing the story of adversarial perturbations. In, in, in perception, uh, it, it is known that when you have a picture that your machine learning algorithm can classify correctly, if you perturb that uh, in a very specific way um, and the resulting image is not any different to humans, um, but but it can be classified incorrectly by by machines with very high confidence. So this thing that is classified as panda uh, with some moderate com uh, confidence can be classified after this adversarial perturbation by a machine learning model as a given with very high confidence. 
And this is pretty uh, unfortunate and, and dangerous. Well, if you reverse the story here, if you try to perturb this in such a way that you boost the confidence, then you have your unadversarial object. So th the adversarial example is done, it, this is obtained by maximizing some loss, uh, ma maximizing the loss function over the perturbation um, over the, on the image. Well, this creates an adversarial agent. Well, why not train a perturbation to minimize this loss, right? So reverse the story again, uh, minimize the, con take, convert this to a minim uh, minimization operation. And then uh, you, will, you can come up with special perturbations and textures um, for you to use. And reinforcement learning agent can be benefit from such, such modifications uh, in the environment. So the, I'm running out of my time. So these were just three of the challenges and there's definitely more such as things like dealing with reward functions and especially dealing with multi-objective reward functions. Uh, there are approaches around inverse reinforcement learning that could help with this. And uh, one of the bur uh, barriers in front of adapt adoption of RL is the lack of guarantees in safety critical environments, uh, unlike classical controllers like PIE controllers. There's a lot of research going on in safe reinforcement learning as well. Um, high dimensional action spaces are usually hard to deal with. Open AI's work around using action embeddings used in Open AI 5 I, are quite promising. And I think we are seeing progress in all these directions uh, that are hopefully um, lower the entry bar for entry for reinforcement learning. And uh, if you want more reading on this, uh, on this topic, definitely I would recommend these three papers. Alex Erpon's, this blog is, is very uh, enjoyable read. I definitely recommend it. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a pessimistic view uh, and it is too old at this point. It is two years old, um, and which is too much time in AI. But definitely take a look at these uh, comprehensive, comprehensive um, work to um, get a better idea about the main challenges. And that is basically it from my side. If you have any um, thoughts, comments, questions, I will be happy to chat. And thank you very much again for, for the opportunity. Great, yeah, thank you very much, Enes. Uh, it was really a fascinating talk. Um, and for the people online, so the first thing is typically you have a lot of questions. It's also good. Um, so please write them under the uh, Q&A tab and not in the chat. So then we can go through them. And uh, yeah, I thought they had, you had a slide of your book. Maybe you can show that. Yeah, so if you, uh, I, there's, there's more in the book if you're interested in. Uh, or two maze on the publisher website. So I go into some of the more details. So I have the link to the book and also I have a link to some additional discussion on the slides about designing reward function and whatnot, which, which is going to be available um, at this address that I shared at the, at the beginning, which is um, github.com slash nsbillgame slash talks. Uh, I, I very much like the the picture you're painting that we have to move it seems uh, away from this you know using single algorithms or putting things together by hand basically what we would need is like this whole framework where all these tools you mentioned is already there right and then you can just pick them um, like this curriculum learning uh, constraint exploration and all these ideas mm -hmm. I, I guess that will come at some point i think that there, there, there are a few questions maybe um yeah, uh, I think both of them are around um, how to um, go into um, uh, how to break into the field, basically. Um, so I think there is increasingly um, th th there there are tools that are um, and and content being created. So definitely, I would recommend with a um, starter reinforcement learning book. Um, my book is not a uh, entry book. 
Um, so Rich Sutton's book is not an entry book, I think, to the field. I would just go to Amazon and pick one RL book uh, as an introduction, just to get an idea. Then I would go into OpenAI's um, spinning up for spinning up RL. I think the the um, name of the website. Um, they 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 expose you in a way uh, to, to reinforcement learning in a way that is easy to understand, and they have sample. Um, a sample code as well. So spinning up OpenAI is definitely a great resource. Um, third, uh, when you want to go into more theory, um, I would definitely recommend the uh, lectures available online um, by, by, by Professor Ser Sergey Levine on UC Berkeley. Uh, definitely check it out. It is, it is advanced, but it is, I, I benefited a lot myself from, from that. Um, there are other courses by, I think, um, David Silva. Um, and finally, I think follow the blogs um, on uh, OpenAI, DeepMind's uh, blog, Microsoft Research blog. They, they provide fascinating content. And uh, it, is, it is very fun to read. And they, they, they also give a good amount of details. I think... Uh, Along the way, at some point, you may need to visit, revisit your probability uh, and uh, maybe statistics a little bit. But hopefully, it's not it's not that uh, that bad. So you can you can break into that after some some reasonable amount of work. Yeah, some more questions are coming. How many? How big is your R team in Microsoft? So um. I think we are approaching 100 people in entire Project Bonsai, um, and it is it is it's it's uh, reinforcement learning is just one aspect of it. There's there's an entire work around um, serving this as a platform, integrating with uh, um, uh, integrating with simulators, etc. I think in the AI side, maybe we are around 15 people. Uh, the entire organization is, I think, closer to maybe 100. Um, Model-based RL and hierarchical RL from the point of uh, sample efficiency. Um, um, so, so I think model-based RL is a very powerful thing. So if you, um, in our brains, we have some some world model, and we are not we are, we are not sort of blindly trying to associate every single frame that we are seeing with a with a reward or, or with a value right so we, we when someone throws a ball at you you probably have a you have a pretty good idea about how this this thing is going to evolve and how the ball is going to move forward so definitely model based rl is is it's an absolutely promising direction in in this and we this, we are definitely looking into that i as I said in the, in the beginning, so the approaches that I mentioned are also few of them, are only few of them, there's, there's other. Hierarchical RL, I think it is similar to what I described as um, cons divine, the, dividing the task into uh, concepts. Um, so as I said, definitely uh, uh, hierarchical RL makes it easier for you to master like smaller, smaller tasks. Uh, second question, I think, did we use uh, curriculum learning in the Cheetos project? I, I believe so. I'm not sure if the, any public paper, like scientific papers published yet, but I think whenever there is a chance, we are trying to leverage uh, curriculum learning. Um, how, how well does reinforcement learning cope with non-stationary environments? Are there any specific attempts to crack this issue? Uh, that's that's uh, one of the major challenges. If you go to the um, uh, the papers that I mentioned, uh, um, they, they they list this as a major challenge. I think oh, domain randomization is the primary tool at this point that you want to expose your agent to really different conditions, and then hopefully you 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 capture some non stationarity. So if you use memory along with domain randomization. We can hopefully uh, understand the um, changing dynamics of the environment and where the di where the environment environment is evolving towards. Um, again, your LSTM can uncover these hidden dynamics, and then um, 
uh, th then you can adapt to, uh, to, to the environment. Meta learning is obviously is the way in the future, I think, to deal with this. It, it, it's by definition about adapting to the environment. Uh, it, it, in connection with domain randomization, it is also some of the approaches in meta learning is is using LSTMs and such memory based approaches. Um, what RL frameworks would you recommend? I we are using RL lib, and in the book I am using RL lib. I think it is very powerful. Um, for production purposes, I think I would recommend RL lib. Uh, for Learning purposes, I would recommend OpenAI's spinning up um, project. Mm -hmm. I think I missed a question at the beginning, a question regarding augmenting simulation with <clears throat> unadversarial data. Won't this become a problem and infer inferring in the real world? Are the computer vision agent would search for similar texture? Maybe I was not clear. The purpose is to um, actually print this pa patch and put your own on the object in the real environment, right? So that the, your agent can easily pick up on, on the object. So you you design this texture, you design this patch, whatever it is, I think you can you can do it with both ways. And in, in the actual environment, you just stick this patch on your on your object so that again it can be perceived easily. So that's that's the very purpose. Um, how can we deal with the number of arms in thousands. Um, you augment this. Uh, you augment the sim and real both. Um, actually, yes. So you you first train uh, this <clears throat> this patch. What this patch should look like. Um, you you train your agents in simulation with that. But hopefully, by definition, this patch is going to make it easier. That's in at at some point you 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 may not even need. Um, to retrain your your uh, perception model because again it is by design is going to boost the correct answers from your perception model and hopefully you can just directly print the patch on your um, on your objects. So how to deal with um, tons of uh, actions uh, in Netflix like Netflix like problems in in contextual bandits? I think I I have not worked in recommendation systems a lot. I think. And definitely two approaches are, first of all, using a filtering mechanism to limit the available actions. Um, second, I think, as I mentioned, action embeddings could be helpful. So action embeddings allow you to uh, come up with an intent vector. So rather than coming up with a specific action, the output of your policy is something like, I really want to watch something relaxing and maybe um, from from Hollywood this tonight. So your policy suggests an intent. It is it does not directly correspond to an action. Then you take that intent vector, you compare it with your uh, the embeddings of your, of your movies. So intent vector comes from your policy. Your movies have embeddings associated with them, describing their uh, features and content. You look at the similarity in between and pick the best one. So I think action embeddings are pretty pow powerful in that sense. Um, we have one one minute. I don't know. I, I can try to take on the answers, but uh, I want to leave it to you at, at this point. I don't want to go over time. Yeah, yet. you're right. I mean, at some point we have to close. So <laughs> thank you very much yeah, for answering all sure. your questions. And you can, you can reach you can reach me over LinkedIn. I I will try to. Uh, give my two cents um, if, if you find it helpful. Yeah, great. Great. So also, uh, as people know, you know, we have LinkedIn community there. Um, <clears throat> you can also answer to the, to, to the topics there. And yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ines. Um, we, I thank we have you the for inviting me. Uh, to, to give little presents to our speakers. And since it's uh, online now, we usually before it was like, something physical you know something you could eat or so but uh, now it's something we can send by by email so <clears throat> you'll re receive a little present from us um yeah and for for the rest uh everybody uh, thanks for the for listening and uh hope you liked it and uh, see you at our next event thank you thank you a lot
I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Nice talk. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.